Good morning and good afternoon and good evening to those of you outside the Washington area. I'm Suzanne Maloney, Vice President and Director of Foreign Policy at the Brookings Institution. And I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of our Center for Middle East Policy to today's event on the Enduring US-Jordanian Alliance. We are excited to gather virtually to launch an important new book by Bruce Rydell, who is a senior fellow in the Center for Middle East Policy here at Brookings and a veteran analyst of the region, having served for 30 years at the Central Intelligence Agency and as a senior advisor on South Asia and the Middle East to four US presidents on the staff of the National Security Council at the White House. Jordan and America, An Enduring Friendship is the first book to tell the story of the two countries more than 70 year bilateral relationship. In this remarkable book, Bruce traces the story of how American presidents from Dwight Eisenhower to Joe Biden have worked closely with Jordan, first with King Hussein, who came to power in 1952, and then with his son, King Abdullah, who inherited the throne in 1999. Bruce brings his enormous experience and expertise to bear as he lays out the history of the relationship and provides fascinating insights and new details, especially in his telling of the two wars fought between the US and Iraq and of the Arab-Israeli conflict in diplomacy. Joining Bruce on screen and moderating today's conversation is Mike O'Hanlon, who's Director of Research in the Foreign Policy Program and Senior Fellow and Director of our Center for Security, Strategy, and Technology here at Brookings. We'll be taking questions from viewers, which can be submitted via email to events at brookings.edu or via Twitter on, at hashtag Jordan and America. With that, I'll hand the floor over to Mike and look forward to this terrific conversation. Suzanne, thank you and greetings everyone. And it's a real privilege to be joining my colleague, Bruce Rydell, as well as you, Suzanne, for this great discussion of an amazing book. I'm just gonna gush for one minute uh, in compliments before I get into the actual questions. I've read all of Bruce's books. I've had the pleasure and privilege of being his colleague as has Suzanne for about 15 years. And he's just one of my favorite writers at Brookings. He gets to the point better than anybody I've ever read, both uh, listening to him and reading him. He's written previously on Pakistan, on Al Qaeda, on the Saudi relationship with the United States, on other topics as well, and some of them historical, going back to the United States involvement in the Middle East in the 1950s. And this book, in my opinion, is simply his best among a lot of hits. And the reason I say that is, partly because the analysis is so good, but partly because the story is so fascinating. And Jordan is so much at the linchpin of Middle East politics, of so many events. It's either at the eye of the hurricane, if you will, or part of the mix, depending on the crisis. And, and also it's been a longstanding friend of the United States, as Bruce explained. So uh, Bruce, congratulations on just an amazing piece of work. As I've said before, I hope Netflix makes a mini series out of it because the drama is so, so capturing and captivating. And I wanted to just congratulate you, but also ask you to begin by telling us what is so special about the U.S.-Jordan relationship that made you want to write this book and why, in your opinion, has it on balance been a success? Thank you, Mike. And thank you, Suzanne, for that very kind introduction. And thank you, Mike, for your gushing. Um, I deeply appreciate it. Um, the U.S.-Jordan relationship uh, has been a success. Uh, in many ways, it's a bit of an unlikely success because Jordan sits in the epicenter of the Middle East, uh, the eye of the hurricane, as you call it, surrounded by Syria and Lebanon to the north, Iraq, and behind that, Iran uh, to the east, Saudi Arabia and Yemen and the Gulf to the south, Israel and the West Bank, the uh, West, and just across the Gulf of Nakaba, Egypt. Uh, all of these countries are bigger, uh, with the exception of Lebanon, they're stronger uh, than in Jordan. Uh, and two of them enjoy extraordinary relationships with the United States, Israel uh, and Saudi Arabia. But yet in this environment of being, let's say, second tier, Jordan has consistently uh, hit above its weight and been more of a player in American thinking and American decision-making than many would imagine. And it has been able to keep pace with its more powerful neighbors like uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia. I think a large measure of the reason for that 
these two extraordinary individuals, uh, King Hussein in particular. Now, King Hussein ascended to the throne at the age of 17. Nobody, including his mother, thought he was going to be a success. Uh, President Eisenhower, uh, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles was mailed to make a visit to the Middle East. And he asked the embassy in Amman to set up a meeting with the king. And the embassy famously uh, responded, why? Nobody thinks he's important. If you want to talk to somebody important, talk to his mother. Um, but instead, he survived numerous assassination attempts. Uh, he survived the disastrous decision made in 1967 put his army under the command of the Egyptians and joined the war against Israel that lost the West Bank and East Jerusalem, Israelis, setting in stage the occupation that continues to this day. Um, he famously tilted towards Saddam Hussein in 1990 uh, and paid a price for that. Uh, but nonetheless, by the time he passed away in 1999, he was universally recognized as one of the great statesmen of his time. And his son, who also survived assassination attempts, uh, has proven to be an adept learner. Uh, he has not made the mistakes that his father made. Although today, we may be seeing a new mistake um, in his real estate procurement. I'm sure we'll talk about that for a while. Uh, but Jordan is a success story, a country that has no natural resources, uh, aside from some archaeological ruins. Uh, is inundated with refugees from Syria, from Iraq, uh, from Palestine. Uh, it has nonetheless, if not prospered, uh, has been a success story. Um, and that story uh, of both Jordan and the Jordanian relationship with the United States is what I thought was important to write about. Fantastic, Bruce, and we will come back, I'm sure, to the uh, real estate story the Washington Post is trying to make a big deal out of, and I'll be curious whether you think the, the Post allegations or the uh, palace's response are more compelling, but we can get to that in just a little bit because you do such a beautiful job with the history, and you touched on a number of the key events in your opening. I wanted to work a little bit through the history and then bring up to date on some key issues such as the state of Jerusalem and the Palestinians, both within uh, Jordan as well as beyond the Syrian civil war and uh, the overall state today of the U.S.-Jordan relationship and just how well ensconced Kim, uh, King Abdullah is in his position after a recent coup attempt. So all of that's on the agenda. But if, if we could go back a little bit and and start with, you mentioned that King Hussein took the crown, or took the uh, throne in 1952 at age 17. And, uh, and then you mentioned his mistake in the 1967 war. I wondered if you could just sort of focus on the 1950s and 60s for a minute and anything else you wanna add about the 67 war or just how his overall rule began during that period of time. Maybe we'll just go through two decades at a time for a minute here and, and, and review the history in a little bit more detail. Well, in the 1950s, when King ascended to the throne, um, Jordan had just acquired the West Bank. Uh, more than doubled its population, uh, and actually had um, very attractive real estate, uh, much more arable land on the West Bank, and of course the tourist attraction of Jerusalem and, and Bethlehem. Uh, the rest of the Middle East looked upon this purchase as illegal. Uh, only two countries in the world recognized Jordan's acquisition of the West Bank. The United Kingdom, the colonial power that had created Jordan, uh, and Pakistan, the country with which Jordan had always had very unique relationships. In fact, when the king ascended to the throne, the most powerful man in the country was not a Jordanian at all, it was a British soldier, um, Glove Pasha, as he was known. And in one of the most dramatic early things he did in his reign, King Hussein threw out Glove Pasha. That I'm, we're taking control of our army. We're going to have a Jordanian army run by Jordanians. Uh, he didn't do it in the uh, nicest of ways. A Pasha who'd been in the country for two decades was basically told you have to leave in two hours. Uh, he was given overnight 
uh, as a bit of a compromise. Um, but it did dramatically establish that the king was now running his own country. Throughout the 50s, there were a series of assassination attempts, coup plots, conspiracies. Um, in 1958, the CIA gave the king uh, crucial information that allowed him to um, preempt one coup plot. But later in 1958, the British had to send paratroopers back to Jordan in order to keep him in power. So it was a real uh, roller coaster ride. In the 1960s, it began to ease up a little bit. Um, relations with Egypt, the dominant player at the time and the revolutionary player in the region, um, improved. Um, and then he got swept up in the uh, moment of, of passion that was produced in May and June 1967. Uh, he didn't listen to the CIA. The CIA was telling him clearly there is no possible way the Arabs can beat Israel. Any combination of Arabs, and if the Arabs will uh, lose within a week if you don't if you join the war. Uh, but swept up in the passion, he went along. Um, that mistake led to the birth of the Fedayeen movement, the Palestinian Nationalist Movement, which almost toppled his throne in 1970 uh, in the Jordanian Civil War. Um, he was able to prevail in 1970, largely because of his own uh, very adept youth elements um, in power. And since 1970, Jordan has been a relatively stable uh, state, it's had some incidents of terrorism, but compared to its neighbor, it's been a remarkably stable um, and productive country. Great. So now we're into the period of relative stability, but it's also a time where uh, we're going to now have some big events happening pretty soon in terms of the peace process, in terms ultimately of Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait uh, and the crisis that produced in relations with the United States. This is now, now we're entering into this, maybe we can do this sort of the 70s, 80s and into the early 90s together if you don't mind covering that swath of time. And just, just how would you describe it? And how was it that the king was able to basically take Saddam Hussein's side and still wind up in a favorable light as he neared the end of his almost half century in power. The king very uh, wisely uh, realized that um, the reality of American domestic policy, Jordan was acceptable interlocutor for dealing with the Palestinians. Uh, the United States in the 1970s was not or 1980 is not going to agree to deal with the Palestine liberation. Uh, whether you think that was smart or wrong, uh, Hussein realized that America was not going to deal with Israel, but would deal with him. And he was courted by successive American presidents, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, um, H.W. Uh, Bush, uh, all courted the king as the solution. Uh, to the Palestinian problem. Uh, and he played it very cagey. He never said yes, and he never said no. He always said, well, maybe. What's in it for me? Um, and that, as a consequence, was how he was able to survive the epic mistake in 1990 uh, backing the Iraqis. He backed the Iraqis because through the 1980s, during the Iran-Iraq War, the largest conventional war uh, in the world, Korean War. Uh, Jordan was the uh, conduit for supplies going to Iraq. Uh, the highway from Aqaba to Amman and then to the east to Iraq was just filled with trucks, lorries, um, constantly, 24 hours a day, bringing supplies to Iraq. That led to a very close relationship between the king and Saddam Hussein. The king made dozens of trips to Baghdad in those years. And he preached the argument that Iraq was holding back the uh, mullahs and their uh, extremist Islamic ideology. 
Um, that close relationship blinded him in many ways to the sins in the Saddam government. Uh, it's clear that there were people around him who were telling him this was fake, including his own brother, then Crown Prince Hassan, and quite possibly his fourth wife, Queen Noor. Um, he didn't listen to them, and he tilted towards the Iraqis in August 1990, and he paid a heavy price for it. He came to Kenny Bunkport in Maine for a one on one meeting with uh, President Bush, uh, which was absolutely disastrous. Uh, basically, the U.S. cut off all assistance to Jordan and treated Jordan as a prior. H.W. Bush was smart enough to know that when the war was over, that he wanted to try to restart the Arab-Israel peace process, as he promised the Saudis and Syrians and everyone else in the buildup of the war, Jordan was going to be a center. And so, within a matter of months, all was forgiven. Rapprochement was developed, and Jordan was again at the top table, uh, and HW was there uh, supporting. And it's it's a measure of uh, the king's ability to um, come back from uh, flawed decisions that at his funeral in 1999, four American presidents showed up, including H.W. Bush one who had a disastrous relationship uh, in the summer and fall of 1990. It's amazing. And I wanted to just dwell on the personal side for a minute, Bruce, and ask you uh, two questions about relationships that the king had with American presidents or, and, and also with Saddam. Uh, on the Saddam question, you almost make it sound like the king likes Saddam because it's one thing to have a business or economic relationship it's something else to visit Baghdad dozens of times. So question number one, did King Hussein actually like Saddam Hussein? And then question number two, of all the American presidents that you just mentioned, with which one did King Hussein have the closest personal rapport? The first question is a good one. I think the answer is yes. Um, not only did he come and visit uh, Saddam, but they went fishing together. Uh, and other things like that. Now, I should say something about fishing in Saddam's Iraq. Um, fishing in Saddam's Iraq meant throwing a hand grenade in the water, letting it explode, and having the dead fish come to the surface. Not exactly my idea of a fishing trip, but yes, they they seem to have bonded, um, and I think that that uh, blinded uh, King Hussein to the realities of Saddam Hussein's situation. But bear in mind, the rest of the world backed Saddam Hussein in the Iran-Iraq war too. Um, the Reagan administration uh, fully endorsed uh, the Iraqis. And by the end of the war, the United States was providing intelligence to the Iraqis. Uh, we were fighting, in essence, an undeclared naval war uh, on the side of the Iraqis against the Iranians in the Gulf. Um, so Saddam succeeded in, in let's say, confusing many, many people. The American president that I think, uh, hands down, came the same bond with most uh, was the last. Bill Clinton. Was who, I'm sorry, it cut out a little bit when you said that. Was, was the last, Bill Clinton. I think the relationship between them um, was very, very close. Um, they, uh, King Hussein often came to the United States and particularly, of course, in the last couple of years uh, before 1999, he came for uh, cancer treatment, medical treatment. And I think that that naturally led to a bond between uh, the president and the king uh, that got very, very close. Uh, the president also went out of his way to get Jordan almost everything that he wanted from free trade agreement. Um, F-16 aircraft uh, for the Royal Jordanian Air Force, um, and of course, the signing of the Israeli-Jordanian peace uh, only spent it. You know, we look back on the 1990s in the era of the Madrid process and the Oslo process uh, were hectic, really well, epical events, uh, but as a product, 
the only real product that survived and was sustained from all that effort was the Israeli Jordanian peace agreement. It was very important to both of them, particularly important to Israel. Jordan is Jordan has the longest border of any Arab state with Israel. And since Jordan has a majority Palestinian population, uh, it has a unique relationship with both Palestinians and with the Israelis. So you mentioned the Israeli-Jordanian peace accord of the 1990s. Is that really the signature accomplishment of the last decade of the king's life? Clearly it's one of them, but um, how would you sum up the 1990s before we get on to King Abdullah and the modern era? I think the, the, the peace agreement was the pinnacle of the king. Um, his grandfather, who was assassinated in front of his eyes, um, literally, had begun secret dialogue uh, with uh, and That dialogue predated the 1948 war. Uh, and the reason he was assassinated was that he was in Jerusalem to see the uh, For several years after he ascended to the throne, the king kept the Israelis at arm's length. But by the 1960s, he too was engaged in secret dialogue. Uh, and that became more intense after the 1967 war. And it was not just a dialogue at the top. The Jordanian and Israeli intelligence community shared intelligence about threats um, to both of them. Uh, and shared intelligence with the United States as well about uh, potential terror threats. The king saw in the Oslo process when the Palestinians were formally acknowledged by the Israelis as a negotiating partner, his opportunity. He now could make his own peace with Israel and say, in effect, to the PLO, it's up to you to make your peace with Israel. I'm going to make mine. And he ended up making it. And in one of the most important parts, he had the peace treaty uh, recognize that Jordan has exceptional responsibility in terms of protecting religious sites in Jerusalem. Both the Muslim and Christian religious sites are under a form of Jordanian uh, oversight, uh, which in practice means that Jordan still does have a role in Jerusalem, despite the fact that it lost the 1967 war. And that role is very, very important to the Jordanians. Uh, it gives the king uh, and the Hashemites a degree of legitimacy um, that is very important to them surviving in the power. Yes, thank you. And I want to now turn towards King Abdullah, but I think I'll pick up if I could just add one quick small editorial comment, which I know that is an issue you get at in the book as well. But when I was privileged to meet with King Abdullah the week after Donald Trump defeated Hillary Clinton, it was fascinating to me. I had, I had met him briefly before in the United States, but and don't consider myself, I wouldn't say I'm a friend of the Kings, although I happily be a friend. He's an impressive individual, but I was granted uh, a, a chance to talk. And what I was struck by is how much he was fixated on the Jerusalem question and the Islamic and Christian holy sites, perhaps more than anything else that seemed to, uh, you know, make him wonder what years of Trump rule in the United States would be like. Uh, it seemed above and beyond even the Syrian civil war or any other Middle East issue, the Jerusalem question is what really immediately grabbed his attention out of the uh, Trump campaign and very much fits with what you're saying. So I wanted to ask uh, now moving on, if we could to King Abdullah and the early years, uh, for example, how did he react to the 9-11 uh, attacks and then the U.S. decision to overthrow Saddam Hussein. What was his role in that particular Iraq conflict? But if you want to also touch on the way in which the dynastic succession occurred and the considerations that may have been in King Hussein's mind as he decided that Abdullah, in fact, should be his successor rather than anyone else or another son. So if you could maybe touch on those early years of Abdullah and then we'll go to the modern era. Um. King Hussein had uh, appointed his half brother, Hassan, the crown prince, for 33 years. Uh, and everyone assumed Hassan would 
than to the throne. Um, probably assumed a little bit too much um, because the king, uh, in the back of his mind, always wanted to have his own son become king. And we now know uh, from various sources that the king had spoken about that privately um, to various American and Jordanian officials over the years, never in an official way, but he hinted that he won. And so uh, literally on his deathbed, um, Hassan was removed and Abdullah was placed in line of succession um, with Queen Noor's eldest son, Hamza, as the crown prince queen governor. Uh, I should say just a moment about the funeral. Um, it was really the funeral of the century. Uh, dozens and dozens of heads of state, monarchs, and crown princes and princesses all showed up. Four American presidents, including Bill Clinton. Um, it was really an extraordinary event. Uh, uh, it took place in the pouring rain, uh, which Jordanians all said is a sign that God was crying for the passing of Hussein as well. Um, the uh, extraordinary funeral helped to propel Abdullah into his office. In many ways, he was poorly prepared for this. He thought he was going to be a soldier. Now he suddenly found himself as the king of a small kingdom, uh, part of the world, prone to violence. Um, and the 9 11 uh, attack uh, speeded everything up. He was on his way to the United States, literally, as the attack took place and had to turn back to Jordan. He came to the United States quickly afterwards, offered all the help that Jordan could provide, including intelligence, but also including uh, on the ground support for the American effort in Afghanistan. Um, he was troubled by uh, George W. Bush's plans to invade Iraq. Uh, he thought that this would only unleash chaos in Iraq and would only benefit the Iranians. But here's an instance where he really learned from his father. His father had had real doubts about the first Gulf War and enunciated them publicly uh, and laid them out for everyone to see. Abdullah had real doubts about the second Gulf War. But he kept those doubts largely. He expressed them to President Bush privately, but he didn't make a big public deal. And when push came to shove, he allowed the United States to use Jordan as a base for prosecuting parts of the war, mostly uh, the rescue of downed pilots, um, things like that. Uh, but he, he, learned, he learned from his father's mistake. Uh, you may not like it, but go along with it. Uh, and that uh, impressed uh, George W. Bush, uh, who continued to support um, uh, Jordan. Uh, and Barack Obama largely inherited that and uh, also forged a, a pretty strong bond um, with King Jordan, or with King Abdullah. Um, a bond that survived the Arab Spring and to certain extent, survived the Syrian civil war, which was a much bigger challenge uh, to the relationship. The Jordanians, of course, regard Syria as their most immediate threatening state. Uh, Syria has been a threat to Jordan almost from the beginning of the kingdom. Um, and the Syrian civil war was, in Abdullah's mind, an enormous cause of chaos in the region, including uh, sending literally hundreds of thousands of refugees into Jordan. Uh, and the king, like many Americans, wanted Barack Obama to, quote, do something about it, come up with a solution. Uh, but as we all know, uh, Barack Obama didn't have a solution uh, and wasn't prepared to invest the resources uh, in the Syrian civil war. It led to some tension in the relationship, um, not a, a rupture, of any, but some tension. 
So on that Syrian civil war issue, if I could hone in on that with a follow-up question a little bit more, do you think that the king was basically against uh, our effort to try to unseat Assad, even though we never were enthusiastic about it? And as you say, President Obama never figured out how to sort of reconcile his preference to see King or, or President Assad go with his also with his equally strong or stronger desire for the United States not to become overly involved in yet another Middle East quagmire. Uh, was King Abdullah just against uh, the even the idea of unseating Assad, or did he feel that if we're going to do it, we got to do it right, got to do it big, got to do it quick and clean, and maybe he would have been willing to see us do another big overthrow invasion kind of occupation effort if we had really been committed, uh, or you know, exactly where did the king come down on what should have been done about Syria in the context of the Arab Spring and the unrest there? I think it was more the second. But if you're going to do it, you got to do it right. You've got to put the resources. This is a major commitment. It may involve in an American boot something. But like uh, I would say most of us, um, while the king had an overall objective, getting rid of Assad, he too didn't have a very specific, how are we going to do this? Um, how do we make the Syrian opposition a united uh, front uh, that has real credibility, uh, given the, the divisions within it, given the rise of uh, Al-Qaeda linked factions, Syrian opposition, uh, and given the fact that the Russians, and Iranians, and Hezbollah were prepared to put their own troops in significant numbers. Um, like many of us, the king wanted a solution, but didn't really have a coherent game plan how to get it. And today, I think he's come to the conclusion that Assad is here to stay and that they've got to get along with it. Yesterday, and the other news was great, um, Bernadian news agency announced that the king had taken a phone call uh, from Bashar Assad, which I think is the first time he's spoken directly to Assad uh, since more than a decade. By the way, you've already answered two questions from the audience that came in on Jordan without even trying, so thank you. But I wanted to follow up with one while we're on the Jordan question with one more of my own and one more from the audience. The one from the audience is, do you think that King Abdullah has coordinated any of his, uh, you know, detente uh, towards Syria with Washington, or has that been on his own? Uh, and maybe I'll put that one to you first and then come back with a second. I think there's no doubt he raised this with the Biden administration. Um, the King was the first foreign leader, first Arab Middle Eastern leader that Joe Biden spoke to after the election. Uh, and he became the first Middle East leader uh, that Biden spoke to uh, after his inauguration. And this summer, uh, the King and Queen uh, came to the United States for a quite long visit. It was three weeks long. Um, uh, that's longer than any summer vacation I had. Uh, and, he, and he traveled all around the United States, including talking to CENTCOM in Tampa uh, and senators and congressmen in the United States. Uh, and he had a lengthy discussion with Biden. So I'm sure the question of what to do with Syria came up. I think that the Biden administration does not see Syria as the uh, first year, something that needs to be resolved. Um, we haven't heard the uh, let's bring the troops home from Syria uh, message that we heard in the Trump administration, for example. Um, I think the Biden administration is basically willing to let this play itself out, which means that if Abdullah wants to try to uh, gain concessions out of Assad uh, or 
Assad to be returned to the international community, they're happy to let him drop. I think the serious doubts um, that he's going to get much, um, but they're going to let him try. And they also realize that Jordan needs a uh, border with Syria that is stable and that is open uh, in order to uh, keep its economy going. So let me now, uh, one more question on the broader Syria issue, but it actually is going to take me to Iran and Saudi Arabia too. So let me put that all together. And I guess the first question is when King Abdullah looks at Syria, does he think at all in sectarian terms or also with Iraq? I mean, he's a Sunni Muslim and um, almost everyone in Jordan is Sunni Muslim, as I understand, including virtually all the Palestinians. Uh, but the king, to my mind, has never been particularly sectarian in his thinking, at least as best I can tell. I may be wrong, so please correct me. But I'm, I'm sure that whether he is thinking in sectarian terms, he has Iran on his mind because everybody in the region does. So that raises the question of what kind of a relationship is he trying to have with Iran, which also then obviously raises the question of his relationship with Saudi Arabia. Uh, on which he's and Jordan's often depended for some financial support over the years, but where there is a certain amount of divergence in outlook on a number of issues. So I wonder if you could address the sectarian, the Iranian and the Saudi questions sort of as part of a whole. Um, I think it's important to start with uh, the Hashemites. The Hashemites are literally the descendants so we froze up a little. Okay. Um, this is not a this is, this is not a uh, uh, propaganda argument. Um, Hussein and Abdullah are uh, direct descendants of the Prophet Muhammad. And they come from the tribe of the Quraysh and the family of the Hashim. Uh, in that sense, yes, they are Sunnis, but they also like to portray themselves as above sectarian. That not only do Sunnis see them as descendants of the Prophet, but Shias see them as descendants of the Prophet as well. So they're not just descendants of the Prophet Muhammad, they're also descendants of Ali, the figure to whom Shias regard as the leader of their. Now, in practice, Jordanians are all Sunnis, uh, Palestinians, East Bankers. Uh, and they are very much. Uh, and on some occasions, King Abdullah has talked in sectarian terms. Uh, after all, he's the, he was the person who came up with the notion of the Shia crescent. Um, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, uh, and Iran. Um, he's generally avoided that kind of sectarian language. Uh, and he has sought over the years to modulate relations with Iran. He's actually visited uh, which is pretty unusual for a uh, Arab leader. Um, and in that sense, he has uh, been an opponent of turning the region into a sectarian battle. Uh, and he's been privately critical of the Saudis for escalating uh, the Sunni Shia uh, confrontation as high as they have. And I think it's safe to say that in the last year, we've seen signs that the Saudis themselves have realized it's gotten out of control, trying to dampen it. And there are ongoing um, semi-secret uh, conversations between the Saudis and the Iranians going on in Iraq. Um, the King has also tried from the beginning after the United States invasion uh, to buck up uh, moderates in Iraq. Uh, he, one of the first foreign leaders to go to Baghdad at a time when most of the Arab world um, was at arm's length uh, from the government of Baghdad because it was Shia government. Because a majority of Iraqi Shias, so if you have an election, you're going to get an Iraqi Shia government. Um, the king, despite that, tried to engage and support the Iraq government. So, on this issue, as on so many others, uh, the king tries to play a moderating role, uh, trying to escalate rather than increase the level of um, confront terrorism 
uh, rather than to confront uh, religious identity. Uh, By the way, on that same notion, do you think that if the Israeli-Palestinian peace process ever did resume in a meaningful way again, that the king would try to be a helpful participant? Or do you think he is at a point now where he views that problem as just so intractable that even if there were the trappings of initial talks that he would try to stay away? Uh, the Jordanians, both Hussein and Abdullah, have talked in blue, uh, telling American leaders from Eisenhower, uh, Trump, the Israel-Palestinian conflict, the war problem, and that failure to address that has all these ripple effects, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, um, whatever. Um, I would say with the rare exception of Bill Clinton, um, haven't been very successful in persuading American presidents to put in the kind of resource, time, uh, effort. And of course, since Bill Clinton in the end did not succeed, um, this is not exactly a uh, model that other presidents are likely to follow. Um, I think they're still determined to try to get an agreement. Uh, I think they would they would try very hard to be hopeful in that regard. Um, but I think they've also come to realize that the current state of leadership, both on the Israeli side and the Palestinian side, is not conducive to a resolution. So just look at the Palestinian side. Uh, Hamas runs Gaza, there's a huge presence in the West Bank. Uh, Abu Mazen is long past the uh, cancellation date. Um, and there's really no sign of a new emerging Palestinian leader um, who's going to be able to take on the reins uh, and make the very difficult compromise uh, that would be necessary for any kind of solution. So yes, they regard it as absolutely vital. And I'm, I'm no doubt that Biden got an earful about this. But I think they also realize the chances they're going to move Washington on this. And that leads to a question from the audience. So now I'm going to be sort of, you know, interspersing audience questions with a couple more of my own in the remaining 15 minutes or so. But uh, there's a question about Jordan-Israel relations and whether this is a time when they can deepen even beyond the government to government level to be more societal, maybe economic? Are there, are, are there room, are, are there you know, avenues for possible deepening or strengthening of those kinds of relationships between Israel and Jordan, irrespective of what may happen with the peace process? Well, uh, King Abdullah, Bibi Netanyahu, had a terrible um, It all goes back to a plot by the Israelis First, Netanyahu and to assassinate a prominent Hamas leader literally on the street. Um, I had the uh, good fortune, yes, misfortune of, of being put on the phone when King Hussein called Bill Clinton absolutely out of his mind, uh, angry at doing this. Uh, the president wasn't available, so I got the earful uh, from being on this. Um, and his son has the same posture. With the departure of Bibi, there's a noticeable change in mood. Um, Bella has met with the new Israeli leadership. Um, there's been some agreements on water, uh, on air traffic. Uh, there's been a notable change in mood. Whether this will translate into more uh, is anyone's guess. It's very difficult to move the Jordanian people. Um, the majority of Jordanians are, of course, either Palestinians or Palestinian origin. Uh, the Israelis is their enemy. Um, they tolerate the peace agreement. They understand it's, it's to their advantage to have a peace agreement. They're not enthusiastic. Um, they certainly are not enthusiastic about having enough Israelis come and Israelis have not been enthusiastic about going to them. Um, so the human dimension to it 
um, may still be a laggard. But I think there's real possibility for bilateral relationship to improve uh, and to provide real uh, economic gain to both parties. I'll put in a personal advertisement. I went to Amman once and I loved it. So uh, <laughs> to the extent that it's worth encouraging any further tourism or whatnot, people think of Petra, but I also just think the city is fascinating. Uh, I wanted to ask you though, coming, speaking of um, locales and real estate, now let's come back to the Washington Post and this new uh, development in the relationship, which may or may not prove consequential, that somehow, not unlike a number of other rich people or leaders around the world, the king of Jordan has sought to uh, buy up more real estate than he really could plausibly need, than his country could plausibly easily afford, and more than he was willing to acknowledge. And now it's been unearthed. Uh, the, as, as you pointed out in sharing this morning with me uh, a press release from the palace in Jordan, they've pushed back pretty hard and said, you know what, um, speaking of assassination attempts, uh, it, it's probably prudent that some of these properties not have their addresses disclosed uh, because the king may be there. And moreover, um, most heads of state have more than one place where they can receive guests or potentially you know, have a secure vacation. And that's not unusual. And uh, the king does have a certain amount of wealth associated with his position. It's that personal wealth that he's used to acquire these uh, places in California and London, maybe one or two other locations as well. Where do you come down on this story? Uh, do you think the Washington Post had any uh, reasonableness in the sort of tough attack it, it, it levied at the king? Or do you think his defense is compelling? I think the Post's story left out of important details. Uh, let, me, let me start by saying the timing is terrible. This past March, uh, Jordanians uncovered a very large conspiracy in the um, which was talking about um, somewhat vague terms, corruption in the royal palace uh, and the need for uh, Abdullah to step aside uh, and uh, King Hussein's uh, son with a Noor Hamza uh, to become king. Uh, several of Hamza's senior senior aides uh, have been arrested and are in prison. Hamza himself is more or less put under a gag order. Um, even more disturbing for the Jordanians, there was concrete evidence that the Saudis were supporting this conspiracy with money, with social. So the timing is terrible. The whole question of corruption in the kingdom uh, has now risen very much to the surface. Um, particularly at a time when, because of COVID, uh, there are no tourists in Jordan. So a major source of foreign income has gone away. Uh, so Jordanians are hurting. And here comes the story that the king has $100 million worth of private property. Um, I don't think anyone gainsays the right to own property. And after all, he does need to travel to Washington, London uh, for heads of state visits. You're absolutely right. Uh, he needs to be able to go to those places to spot where uh, the security is going to be strong uh, and where he'll have some privacy. Um, the, the, the condos in Georgetown, uh, remember his, his son, Hussein, went to school in Georgetown. And uh, other members of the royal family go to school in the United States. Uh, they have every reason to have a property where they feel safe and secure, in which um, is not publicized on the outside. Um, what I think hurts him is, is two things. One, that all these transactions were done outside the public domain, um, which while not illegal by any means, raises questions of propriety. Um, and then secondly, I think the property in Malibu uh, comes across to most people as a little bit over the top 
uh, for the king of a country or as um, their response, I, I thought their response was quite well done, um, clear to the point, uh, emphasizing no allegation here of the misuse of Iranian government funds, uh, that this is private wealth, um, and that there are good security reasons for why it's done. All that said, this is the timing is terrible. Uh, it's going to raise endless questions. And of course, there's always the, the number one question where did the money come from? Uh, this is a family that, uh, as I relate to the book, started out dirt poor. Uh, King Hussein's mother sold his bicycle at 13 because it was so strapped to cash. How did they get this money? Well, part of the answer is over the years, King Hussein had begun to acquire money too. Uh, King Hussein had an absolutely fantastic uh, house in, um, in Maryland called the River House. I had the uh, good fortune of visiting several times. This was really quite a mansion. Uh, they ended up selling it to, to the owner of the Washington, uh, then Washington Redskins, now Washington no-name football team. Um, uh, so there was money. They also had residences in London. So uh, that's part of the answer. I think another part of the answer is Emirati friends. Um, Gordon has a long established close relationship with the United Arab Emirates. Um, I think Abdullah's half sister, Aya, was married to the Crown Prince of Dubai for many, many years. They broke up. I, I suspect that some of this money is Emirati money. Uh, even to the thing in nice places to live. Um, in this case, this is a question of appearances. Appearances don't look uh, and statements of smart move. If I was advising the thing, I would say you need to go a little bit further. Um, maybe it's time to dispense with some of these properties or, or to find it different way to have them kept in uh, legal terms. So that it's more than a you know, private property of, of one individual. Thank you. Very thorough and thoughtful answer. Very fair. Um, I have two last questions. And I think it's, there's a natural logic to them because picking up on this issue of corruption and Jordan's relative poverty. I wanted to ask you about sort of the health of Jordanian society and the economy. Uh, a, a snapshot today, but also your prognosis for the future. And then that leads naturally to the final question, which would be what's your prognosis for the future of the U.S.-Jordan relationship uh, based on all the uh, historical and contemporary analysis that you've provided. So if we could start with the Jordanian economy as well as more generally the strength of society, educational systems, economic opportunities, et cetera. How would you assess that right now? When the British created Jordan literally a century ago, 1921, Winston Churchill created Jordan. We like to say he had a free afternoon in Jerusalem and created the Emirate of Transjordan in that free afternoon. The British also called Jordan vacant lot, but there was really nothing there. And they were right. There was uh, a little bit of arable land along the Jordan Valley. Uh, Amman in those days was, I'd say, borderline village to town. Um, there was practically no people. Um, there was really nothing to this. Uh, now, a century later, there's 10 million Jordanians, many of them refugees. Uh, they're, not, they're not prosperous. Uh, they don't have the lifestyle of gutteries. Um, they don't have oil. Um, they do have Petra. Uh, unfortunately, in pandemic, few of us are traveling uh, around the world to go to archaeological. As the pandemic eases. That will ease, and we, I'm confident the tourists will come back, and that will help. 
Um, I would answer your question this way. Jordanians are smart enough to know that it's not just a question of how are they doing. It's a question of how are they doing in relationship to their neighbors. And I think the answer to that is we're doing pretty well. Uh, we're not 10 years into a brutal civil war that has torn our country apart by we're not 50 years into a brutal civil war like Lebanon, which is basically involved in the country. We're not occupied by the Israelis uh, as the Palestinians on the other side of the Jordan line. Uh, we haven't had endless wars and endless uprisings as the Iraqis have. And we, thankfully, are not bogged down in a quagmire in Yemen uh, like the Saudis are. So life is, you know, in part, how do you think you're doing yourself? But it's also, how are you doing in response to your, your neighbors? And here I think the king benefits a lot from Jordanians knowing that while they may not be living uh, the high life, uh, they're not living uh, under occupation or under the constant threat of war and aerial um, Even when they look at Egypt, uh, they're not living under a military dictatorship that is as uh, hard line uh, as the military dictatorship that is involved in the So I think that's a very big source of um, stability. are doing better than almost anyone else around. U.S.-Jordanian relationship, I think, is, is Set to cost. Um, Gordon had uh, four tough years with Donald Trump. Uh, he made it clear in his first foreign visit uh, that his heart was with the Saudis and the Israelis uh, and that Jordan wasn't on his list. Uh, the king tried very hard to build a relationship with Trump, but after the end of the year or so, we come to the conclusion there was no there there. Uh, the deal of the century that uh, Trump uh, proposed uh, for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict would have been a disaster for Jordan. Uh, the annexation of the Jordan River Valley uh, might have led uh, to the termination of the Israeli-Jordanian peace agreement. Uh, I think one of the reasons why the UAE was able to get the uh, Abraham Accords through was that even Israelis realized that annexation of the West Bank, uh, Jordan River Valley, uh, could lead to a disastrous disruption in the Israeli Jordan. Uh, Joe Biden may not be eager to jump into the negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians, but he's not going to push a deal um, that is so disastrous. And when he did make his phone call uh, supporting the king after the discovery of this conspiracy, he went out of his way to say not only did he support the king, but he supported the two states. Now, the two-state solution may be all but dead, but nobody in the Middle East, possible exceptions and few extremists, uh, want to see the two-state solution totally buried. Uh, it is important to at least keep the concept of the two-state solution along, uh, and Joe Biden's going to do that. Uh, I think Biden will look at this Washington Post story and say, um, uh, doesn't change the fact that Lynchpin of the Middle East and the King Abdullah, a uh, moderate friend of the United States, uh, who provides us base to operate against ISIS and Al Qaeda, uh, and who has been a consistent uh, supporter of American counterterrorism efforts throughout the region. I think uh, Joe Biden, years and years, of experience in foreign policy, literally decades, uh, <laughs> knows that Jordan is a friend that he wants to keep in the corner. Um, and he's not going to uh, try to collect taxes from Malibu. And presumably we'll continue to try to provide U.S. financial support, various kinds of development efforts as well, in addition to the free trade agreement we already have, correct? Jordan is now the number three recipient of American foreign uh, which is really quite remarkable for a small country. Uh, it's a reflection of 
reflection of the importance that most American politicians, both parties, have recognized. Bruce, it's a remarkable book on the U.S. Jordan friendship and relationship dating back about 70 years that you cover in this very impressive study. Uh, thank you for the last hour and the privilege of speaking with you about it. I know we all join in and congratulating and I would encourage everyone uh, to buy this fantastic book as we get into holiday gift season, but also as we think about the future of the Middle East and uh, the future of the Biden administration's policy in that part of the world. So congrats again, thanks for joining and signing off from Brookings. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.